Good morning from Washington, D.C., where we continue to slowly reopen businesses as COVID-19 caseloads decline in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. Meanwhile, across the U.S., areas who open quicker and with fewer plans have begun to see an uptick in the virus, causing some government officials to rethink that process. My name is Paul Kincaid. I'm the Director of Congressional Outreach here at FMC, and I have the privilege of welcoming you to another of our virtual roundtable programs, with today's being hosted on our 50th birthday. That's right, happy birthday to FMC, which was incorporated in Washington 50 years ago this morning. For those of you who weren't able to join us for a special virtual roundtable yesterday, we heard a great discussion on the future of North Korean relations with the United States. You can visit our archives to listen to that and anything else you'd like to listen to at www.usafmc.org sounds. You can also subscribe to virtual roundtable podcasts on both Spotify and Apple. Our discussion today will be interactive. If you have a question at any time during the broadcast, simply move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom screen where you'll see the Q&A button. If you have a question, just click that button, fill out your name and the question, and if we choose you, we'll call your name. You can unmute your microphone and ask your question on the program. Don't worry, it's audio only. We're honored today to join with the Federation of German Industries to present this week's discussion. After what the IMF has called the great lockdown, GDP projections all over the world have plummeted. Manufacturing has fared no better than their service industry or other key sectors, as supply chains have been devastated and factories have come to a standstill thanks to minimal demand with the exception of the medical sector. Now across the economic world, factories are slowly returning to life, so businesses, consumers, employees, and governments face questions. What is the best way to reopen from an economic, health, and productivity standpoint? When will it be safe? How can governments ensure products move and companies recover while employees and consumers' health are protected? Can supply lines recover fast enough to get materials to markets in time? Where is the balance between economic and physical health? These are some of the key questions we hope to answer, at least in part today. Our moderator, who will introduce our esteemed panel, has been a champion of FMC, including serving as the co-chair of the Congressional Study Group on Germany. Since his time on the Hill representing Pennsylvania as a Republican in the United States House and after leaving Congress, Charlie Dent has continued his work with FMC, as well as appearing frequently on CNN. He joins us today from his home in Pennsylvania and will get us started off. Congressman? Uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you all for joining us today on this call, uh, on this program, uh, striking a balance, uh, government and industry's role in economic reopening. And so I'm really delighted today to introduce our two panelists. Uh, first, of course, our very special guest uh, visiting us from Germany is Dr. Joachim Lang or we'd say Dr. Lang in, in, in the U.S. Uh, and Dr. Lang, of course, has a, has a distinguished background, but uh, what he does currently, he is the Director General and a member of the, uh, 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 of the, of the Presidential Board for the Federation of German Industry, uh, which is uh, known as BDI. Um, and uh, I should also note, too, uh, that uh, his colleague in Washington, D.C., Daniel Andrich, He's president of RGIT, which is in Washington, of course, and this is part of the, the, the uh, Federation of, of German Industry, so I wanted to welcome him as well. Uh, so we welcome uh, Dr. Long, who, is, who has held many important positions uh, in, in German government, and of course, and now uh, a leader in uh, German industry. Uh, second, and I should also point out too, Dr. Long is from, uh, his hometown is Kaiserslautern, uh, Germany, or K-Town, which is where uh, so much of the American military presence is within Germany, near Rammstein and Landstuhl, uh, Spengdalem, and other, uh, other communities that uh, many Americans know very well. And I should also note that's the area from which Pennsylvania Germans uh, originally descended, including some of my mother's ancestors. So I wanted to point that out. Uh, now I'd like to also introduce uh, a very good friend, uh, Congresswoman Jackie Walorski. Uh, from Indiana's second district, who's been serving in Congress since 2012. Uh, prior to uh, serving on the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, she served on the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, and she has uh, uh, been uh, very active on issues of trade. I've been in meetings with her, and I've, I've, I've watched her in action, uh, uh, taking the task, Secretary of Commerce uh, Wilbur Ross over steel and aluminum tariffs, I recall vividly, and <laughs> among other things. But uh, real advocate for her community, uh, and, uh, and I'm anxious to hear what she has to say on, on many of the issues. So without any further introduction from me, I was going to ask each of our panelists, starting with the Congresswoman, for about maybe up to five minutes, just give us your thoughts on state of play, 
on the, obviously the COVID issue and the, the reopening and striking this proper balance. Uh, and then I will ask one or two questions and then we're gonna open it up to your questions, uh, those who are attending and all you have to do is hit that chat function on Zoom and we'll, we'll find you or raise your hand, whatever you need to do, we'll find you. So with that, I would like to yield to the uh, gentle lady from Indiana, Congressman Willarski. Wow, thanks so much, Charlie. So good to see you. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that we can meet today. Um, obviously not in person, but you know what? Virtual is like a new thing and probably will be with us forever. So thanks so much. I'm grateful to be here and have the opportunity to talk about the challenges facing our economy in the US and around the world amid the coronavirus pandemic, the solutions Congress is working on, and why I am optimistic that we will come out of this crisis stronger than we were before. I wanna thank the Association of Former Members of Congress, Dr. Lang and Congressman Dent. And I would love to thank all of you that joined us today for this important discussion. So just quickly, over the last few months, we've all been faced with this unprecedented public health crisis, economic crisis as well. No surprise, we've seen people pull together to get through it, over the last few months, we've seen lots of different things happen in different states around the country, but I am from Indiana. In my home state of Indiana, we've slowed the spread of coronavirus and we've flattened the curve. As a result, we're now going through the process of safely reopening. Um, our economy is in a very, very phase one to phase five, very responsible manner. And Indiana is setting an example in this country over the issue of how to do this. How do we protect lives and how do we protect livelihoods at the same time? What is that balance? And, and you know what is our role in remaining vigilant on this issue? I'm fully confident that our state and our country are on the path of recovering, we're rebuilding, and we're growing st stronger than ever before. Because our economy historically was so strong before this crisis, we are in a position to recover and to rebuild. Since the pandemic began, Congress has passed several bills into law, all of you know, including the CARES Act. One of those areas was the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, a critical lifeline that proved to be very important link to help small businesses keep the lights on and to save jobs. More than four and a half million small businesses have been able to access these forgivable loans. We also provided direct payments to every American household except the highest wage earners. We provided relief to healthcare providers and hospitals and made critical investments and expanded testing, contact tracing, medical research and development. This summer, Congress and the Trump administration will look at a, yet another relief bill that's coming soon, probably the end of July. I'm gonna to work to make sure that it supports our Main Street job creators, manufacturers, because I represent one of the largest manufacturing districts in the nation, and to make sure that family farms that have also been impacted by the coronavirus can reap some of that help. Our top priorities should include making small businesses have access to the resources they need, whether it's capital to rebuild or PPE to keep their employees safe, and those are two huge separate issues. <clears throat> we also need to keep working to hold China accountable. So I am on the um, subcommittee on the cor coronavirus crisis oversight. I believe any robust oversight effort has to include looking at the role that China played. China hid the truth about the coronavirus while an outbreak became a global pandemic. They lied and cheated to steal PPE and other medical supplies. They've tried to hack, even continually, as in daily, are trying to hack the researchers who are trying to find treatments and a vaccine. I think it's an outrage, and I think it's part of my job as a member of that oversight committee to make sure that we do not let them get away with that. As we look beyond the immediate challenges of protecting our communities and safely reopening, um, I think there are steps that we need to take and put ourselves in a better position to overcome crisis like the current one. So I recently introduced two bipartisan bills to strengthen our ability to innovate, produce and adapt in, in response to future challenges. The Medical Supplies for Pandemics Act would create incentives for domestic manufacturers of PPE to improve supply chain elasticity and strengthen domestic reserves of critical medical supplies. And the Forward Act would expand the R&D tax credit for small and medium sized businesses in order to boost investment in research and development, including for new treatments and vaccines. By working together on a bipartisan basis, we will recover and we will rebuild. I'm grateful to, to just give you a quick summary to be a part of this forum today and uh, am excited to be involved in the discussion. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Dr. Long. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to join you on this particular day. Congratulations to your anniversary. 
It's always an honor and pleasure to contribute to the discussions of the MS FMC, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so. Um, the coronavirus pandemic has hit both Europe and the United States badly, with our economies uh, taking also a toll due to a strict distancing measure, stayed home orders, but also a demand collapse. Still, I hope that we both, the United States and Europe, will emerge stronger together from these challenging times. The predictions and first indicators of economic performance are worrying. The WTO is predicting a fall of world trade between 13 and 32 percent of this year, which exceeds the trade slump brought on by um, the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9. The ECB expects a downturn of minus 8.7 percent of GDP in the euro area, and our expectation is that German GDP will fall by 6.5% this year and that the economic recovery will probably only start in 2022. Under these circumstances, it is essential that governments react to avoid even worse economic outcomes. In Germany, for example, around 10 million employees are in so-called Kurzarbeit, which is a government-backed scheme where the employment agency pays a work allowance as partial compensation for a loss of earnings caused by a temporary cut in working hours. This instrument helps keep people in employment and to reduce costs for employers. The authorities decided to help struggling companies either through loans paid out with the help of the KFW, which is our state-owned development bank, which was um, created in, two, in 1948 as part of realizing the Marshall Plan through grants for solo self-employed entrepreneurs or through a protective shield of government-backed guarantees. Furthermore, the German government has just agreed upon a stimulus package for the coming two and a half years. 60 billion euros are already factored in until the end of this year. These expenditures will help support private consumer spending and also corporate liquidity for about one percentage point of GDP, thus significantly mitigating the recession. Moreover, public and private investment measures have been announced for the expansion of the German infrastructure, such as digital networks or electromobility. This uh, stimulus package also includes a doubling of the research allowance and funding for mobility and climate change solutions therefore pushing for more innovation in these fields. We at BDI identified four phases in managing this crisis. The first phase is, of course, containment of the pandemic. A successful containment will lead to a re-entry phase lasting several months, during which areas of public life and economic activity will gradually be restored. Yet the re-entry phase is by no means definitive, as it is it can be interrupted by regional, sectoral, or national containment measures in the event of a relapse. The third phase would be a stabilizing period where restrictions on public life will have been largely lifted and economic activity can take place domestically largely undisturbed while international disturbances will still be considerable. A recovery and therefore this fourth phase will possibly not be achieved until 2022. I'd like to think that the German economy was, has now safely arrived in phase two, the re-entry phase, but the transition to phase three, stabilizing, will be a definitely bumpy road. A sustainable progress towards phase three and four will only be possible with close transatlantic connections. I'm absolutely convinced that Germany, Europe, and the United States will need to work even more closely together to stand a chance in these troubling times. The foundation of our transatlantic ties are the shared values of free and open markets, of democracy, and the rule of law. We therefore need to build upon this foundation and cooperate on issues of global interest, such as it was mentioned, China, and strengthen the role of multilateral formats, such as the WTO or the G7. As in any partnership, there are also disputes that we need to tackle head on to improve our ties, such as the U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum against the EU and EU counter tariffs, the unresolved issue of subsidies and tariffs in the Airbus and Boeing case, and the continued threat of tariffs on automobiles. Finding together a solution to these trade issues and having a comprehensive trade agreement in place between the U.S. and the European Union would open up a great potential for an economic boom 
after a particularly difficult time for our economies, markets and employees during this crisis. I'm therefore looking forward to an open discussion with you and thank you for the time. Thank, thank you, Dr. Long. And, uh, and uh, I thought I'd start with a question that's a little off topic, but it's on the, it's the front of mind for everybody. Uh, given the events, I believe, of last week, and given Congresswoman Wilarski's previous service on the Armed Services Committee, she might have a, an opinion as well. Uh, but you saw that uh, uh, President Trump uh, announced that he was going to withdraw, a plan to withdraw about 10,000 troops from southwestern Germany, uh, and uh, that has uh, created quite a quite a rift. Some said it was in re retribution or retaliation for uh, Chancellor Merkel not wanting to attend the G7. Uh, but just, uh, I, I'd be curious what the view is in Germany, and, and, and Jackie, we'll start with you because you're on armed services. Just quick, what your, your thoughts are on that issue and how this is affecting uh, uh, the U.S.-German relationship? Yeah, well, first and foremost, thanks, Charlie. First and foremost, Germany is our NATO ally, and our presence abroad is critical to deterring adversaries, maintaining peace, preserving American leadership and national security interests. And I will say, I was just, I, I was on a NATO tour I think just two summers ago, seven countries, uh, eight days, and I can't tell you how important the preservation of our NATO allies is. And I think to the American people and to most members in Congress, they understand and we treasure uh, our NATO relationship and, and the important role that every country plays, including um, Germany. I'm concerned about limiting the number of troops would prevent exercises that are necessary for readiness and training all through Europe and German leads, Germany leads in so many of those. It's also caused, I think, um, logistical challenges when you look at uh, when it comes to the number of U.S. troops that are around the world that flow through Germany for deployment to bases that are that are all over the, the world. And I think that that's a major disruption. I think more than anything else, I look forward to working with my colleagues and the administration to make sure that any changes that happen involving Germany don't affect our national security. Military readiness is, is always at the top of what we look at in America or the US-Germany alliance. And I think the American people understand why that is so important. Thank you. And Dr. Long, being from K-Town or Kaiserslautern, uh, yeah, where the impacts would probably be felt most great. I'm just curious what the perspective is in Germany and probably from your hometown, especially. Well, especially when you come from an area where there's the largest U.S. air base outside the United States of America, uh, you can imagine that that, that sends shockwaves through this area because many, many people really are friends there. Many um, GI state in that region, they got married and, and others uh, got married and went to the U.S. So there's a real close relationship on, on a personal level. Um, and so th this will not only harm um, the hard power of the United States and uh, the, the strength of the NATO, but it also harms soft power uh, because it affects uh, relationships and uh, also beliefs that have uh, built up over uh, decades. So uh, there's much more to lose than only uh, a certain number of soldiers, um, but, but there's much more, it's also, um, something about trust and confidence and uh, nothing you should play with. And so, so we really hope um, that there's um, the way to negotiate over this issue. Um, I learned that um, also Germany has to, to uh, live up to it, uh, to the numbers uh, that, uh, that are decided. And uh, I see the government uh, improving in, in this area and we very much uh, support this. Um, but it also shows that we must think about being more grown up in, in Europe and that we have to face that uh, maybe this administration and maybe also the next one will have a different look at Europe. Uh, we are not used to this. And uh, so there is a lot of thinking going on um, what is going to be the effect behind this. Uh, it's not only about the numbers. Understood. Well, very good answers. And uh, well... Let me uh, quickly pivot uh, to our topic at hand about reopening. And I'd like to get a sense too, first, in, uh, and I'll start with Dr. Long. Uh, in Germany, your, your unemployment rate is considerably lower than what's than here. And you talked about the program in Germany where, uh, uh, where the government helps supplement the income of workers so that they don't get laid off. Uh, they, and, uh, and the companies might uh, uh, pay them less but then the government fills the, the gap and that's a very innovative program. But I'm just curious, 
what is on the mind of the average person in, in some German Mittelstand, you know, employee? Uh, as, what's their what's their feeling right now? Is they're shifting back to in person work? Same is true, of course, for Jackie in, in Indiana too. What, what are they thinking? What are people thinking about this transition from you know either being idle, not working, or working at home to getting back into the game, so to speak, in person? So, Dr. Long. Thank you, Charlie. So many people were at the, at the beginning were intimidated by the speed and development of this pandemic, um, but uh, our companies reacted uh, in a very um, moderate way. And uh, so whoever could work from home, work from home. And uh, people um, have the security system um, that I described so that 10 million employees get paid although they're not working. Um, and this is, of course, limited to, to a certain um, uh, amount of time. And then they will come back to work. And the, the question is, how many people um, will be um, losing their job after this period? So they, they are safe until a certain date. Um, and then the companies have to decide uh, what to do. So the, the number, you, you, you said it, is um, impressively uh, small at the moment, but we expect at least 1 million of uh, job losses by uh, the end of this pandemic, which is quite a number since we have a very low rate of unemployment, but there will be a price to be paid uh, to this pandemic, even in Germany. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jackie, what, what are your thoughts? How are people in Indiana reacting to all this right now? Going back to work. Yeah, sure. I, thanks, Charlie. So I mentioned earlier, you know, we have been in the works here of protecting Hoosier lives and livelihoods. And there's been a direct balance between keeping people safe when they go back to work. And, and you know, and I, we represent a large manufacturing district. So what we're seeing is many companies right now in the district have protocols to keep employees and customers safe so they can get their economies back up on track and start running. I will tell you this. The rebound in the manufacturing sector in our district has been phenomenal. They are, we are rocketing up very quickly. Now we're doing that because when people come back to work, they are absolutely being given um, PPE. So they're, they're given face shields, masks, gloves, hand sanitizer. Uh, the companies are checking their temperature before they walk in the door and sometimes two and three times a day to monitor their temperature requiring employees to stay home if they feel sick. And even at work, they've retrofitted a lot of these manufacturing companies so they can be six feet apart. And we're seeing amazing results with that. And so I think that um, you know, we're building confidence now in the workforce that they actually can go back and we're seeing orders and you know uh, the workforce coming back strong and our economy is really resonating because we do a lot of things in the RV and boating industry, tourism, disposable income, and people are taking advantage of it. And these guys are seeing record years, record production. Yeah, and uh, well, thank you. And uh, by the way, for, for those who are attending this uh, Zoom uh, meeting, uh, I encourage you to, uh, uh, just hit the chat function or raise your hand and we will uh, take your questions. So I have another question too, and again, I'll, again, I'll start with Dr. Long. You know, how may the, the current situation impact manufacturing's move towards automation? I'm just curious if you see this accelerating now because of the pandemic or, or not. Um, we were already in the, in the midst of a transformation process in, in Germany, which we call Industry 4.0 or uh, Advanced Manufacturing, and the pandemic will help to speed this process up. And uh, so we're very confident that uh, by the end of next year, we, have, um, we will have achieved a, a number of uh, companies that all have already have this process um, implemented uh, so that we can um, start from a new level. Uh, we see that uh, many companies have already done this. Uh, we're, at the moment, we are implementing 5G networks uh, on the shop floor, and uh, this is progressing. Um, and we, we, what we have to do is we have to accompany this by very heavy investments in the public network. Uh, so we are um, very much looking into the state, not divesting or not saving money instead of investing in, in the grid structure. 
And uh, this is what we are pushing for. And, and uh, very luckily in this stimulus package, uh, there's a huge amount of investment in infrastructure also, also in the digital area. Uh, so that we are looking forward uh, to, to seeing this um, result in good numbers next year. Very good. Uh, uh, Jack, do you have any thoughts on automation? You yeah. Don't have to. <laughs> I, uh, I watch it very closely and monitor it because of the manufacturing in our district. And I'll tell you this. So um, in, our, in our district, uh, our manufacturers were deemed essential to begin with, and so they never stopped. They did, you know, shut down for a couple of weeks uh, to retrofit, clean, and that kind of a thing. But one of the reasons our local manufacturers are hiring furloughed workers back, rehiring as fast as they can of anybody that was off for any reason is because the longer we stay siloed away and shut down, um, the weaker our manufacturing becomes. And so I can tell you, automation causes phenomenal job loss and we're trying to hold jobs right now and get people back to work. So it's something that I pay a lot of attention to, but it's a major reason why I think we need to safely reopen and get our people back to work and uh, get our economy moving again. So we are not vulnerable to be very, very weakened by a potential automation. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, we have a question from our very good friend from Allianz, uh, Peter Lefkin, and it's to Dr. Long. And the question, uh, so P uh, Peter, unmute you. Peter, unmute yourself, but it, his question is uh, supply chain resiliency and the need for national and economic security and, and globalization. So Peter, go right ahead. Uh, Dr. Lund, this is relating to, there's been much discussion both in Europe and also here in the United States about supply resiliency, particularly when we see medical equipment and other things, and a recognition that either it's complicated supply lanes, lines um, are so complicated that during times of crisis, they do not work and operate to the detriment of the economies and the citizens and those of those nations involved. Does this signify a retreat from global, from globalization uh, on a global scale and also within Germany? Thank you, Peter, for your question. Um, from a German perspective, we don't, we don't think so. And we, don't, we don't share that very much although it's uh, being discussed also on a political level in Germany, because we see that uh, globalization is uh, causing so many positive effects that um, our answer would be um, investing more in resilience instead of uh, protectionism. And uh, so the companies, what they did when it all started in China, um, they all checked their um, value chains and they have diversified for example, in Asia, and uh, so that will help to, uh, to overcome, for example, a second wave. And then we also had to decide in Germany that sometimes it's better to, um, to have some stocks in, in, in medicine, for example, medical equipment, and also protective equipment uh, that we had in the past, and then after SARS, um, uh, these uh, storage uh, facilities were closed. And uh, so we now know we have to reopen them and it's better to store things than to, uh, to produce it in Germany, which would be much too expensive. Yeah, very good. And uh, well, I have a follow on uh, a question here too, to, to Peters. Um, and how do you see, um, you know, now that you know, we're, we're starting to reopen, what preparations uh, do you see being made for a potential second wave outbreak of COVID-19 later this year? I'm gonna start with uh, Congressman Wolarski on that, but I know that's the fear right now. We're going back to work. Some of these states, particularly in the South, uh, in, the, in the West, um, you know, Texas and Arizona, I guess, and Florida, um, and South, uh, these states have, uh, are experiencing you know, increased outbreaks, while some of the states in the Northeast tend to be a bit more stable right now. Uh, just curious what you guys are thinking on a second outbreak and how this is going to affect uh, reopening. Sure. So you know, the main focus that I've seen, because, you know, when this first happened and I got back to my district in Indiana, I was with all the local task forces of just beating the door of anybody that can help us with PPE. And so I was kind of in charge of getting our share of the national stockpile, strategic national stockpile, knocking on doors of every private industry in our district to convert to making PPE so that there was things moving. Because of that, 
And because the president used the, the Defense Production Act, um, we launched the largest public-private partnership of producing domestically uh, produced PPE that we've ever had in this country. A lot of the manufacturers involved in that right now are in my district and are in the state of Indiana. They're already doing it. They've been doing it. They're going to continue to do it. That's going to play a major role in what we do and so that we are never caught again lacking anything and that we have a regional stockpile as well. Uh, when it comes to research and development, also the issue of investing in the contact tracing, tracing, you know, that's developed now, probably one of our greatest tools in stopping a recurrence, or certainly really minimizing a recurrence, is tracking. And that's what most people are doing right now, of the cases that are starting to come forward now, really looking at where they were, who were they with, going to those people, and, and really chasing this virus backwards. And it, it makes so much more sense. It has a lot more um, things to do in the future uh, than anything else that we know so far. The other issue is I mentioned when I talked in the beginning, I have this bill, the Medical Supplies for Pandemic Act, which basically with Debbie Dingell, it's a bipartisan bill, uh, makes all the sense in the world of just basically saying, never again is this gonna happen. So we're going to, pr we're gonna produce as much as we can inside this country. And we're going to not just do national stockpiles, we're gonna incentivize companies to come on board and make the things that we just needed, continue to make them and making sure people are stocked at a level they never have before. I just uh, last week went to a local hospital of mine and they showed me where they were in their stockpile of their building pre-COVID, COVID and where they're at now, looking at the fin kind of like the end of the line of COVID and preparing for the future. And I'm telling you, it will be all hands on deck, making sure that PPE is um, something that we will never have to fight over, chase, or locate again. Yeah, Dr. Long, any thoughts on the on a potential second wave? Um, it's very similar as um, Congresswoman uh, Walowski uh, described. Um, when we faced the pandemic, we had a national lockdown, and I'm pretty sure we will not have that again. Um, because whenever we can locate um, new cases, we will shut down these on a local basis or a regional basis, but not on a national basis again. And then the companies, as it was being described, have learned a lot. And I'm pretty sure that um, companies will not be a problem. The, gr the gridlock that we see is uh, kindergartens and schools. And uh, we, we also see a lot of problems with workforce not being able to come back to, to work because they have to take care of the children. And uh, so what we decided is that we will have a reopening of our schools after summer vacation, uh, but we don't know what's going to happen if there is a second wave. So uh, we have seen that being the most important single issue to tackle, what to do with the, with the children and the kids um, in, in case of uh, a second wave. And we need to answer this um, because it's being more important than everything else. For everything else, we've already found solutions. We haven't found it yet for, for children and kids. Very good. I, I thought I'd quickly pivot, since Jackie's on the Ways and Means Committee, and, and Dr. Long, you mentioned it in your introduction, um, about the issue of uh, trade tariffs. Uh, you mentioned steel and aluminum tariffs, Dr. Long, and as well as uh, uh, threats uh, on tariffs on European and specifically German uh, cars. Uh, can you guys, can you both give us a sense of where things stand right now uh, and how big a, a, an impediment is this to the, the transatlantic relationship? Uh, why don't we start with Dr. Long on that one? Okay, uh, thank you, Charlie. Well, the pandemic has also slowed down this uh, process uh, because uh, these critical negotiations need face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. And uh, so what we see is that there was, has not been very much progress recently. Um, we think that there is a different approach now, not to put everything in one package, but uh, to have different packages and to talk on, on them separately. Uh, there's one tackling, uh, regulations and uh, how we could deal with this uh, over the Atlantic. Uh, so I think that that's a very positive issue. And we have more um, complicated issues like uh, the US side wanting to talk about agriculture, which is extremely difficult on the European level since we all know that this is a major issue for France and that's why it was excluded. So we should not start with it. So we are very much um, into uh, the way to negotiate some um, 
results first before we enter uh, the critical phase where we have the, the major difficult issues. Uh, Jackie, why don't you give us your thoughts on this? I know you're very outspoken for time on some of those uh, tariffs back in 2017 and 18. Yeah, so I ended up in the weeds for two, two and a half years on this. Uh, never planned it, but did. And I'll tell you that uh, 232 today, Section 232, was on the top of my mind yesterday. We had a hurt. We had a hearing with Ambassador Lighthizer yesterday for probably three and a half hours. And you know, when it gets to me in my little five minutes, I'm rapid fire because I have so many questions because it affects so many companies in our country and obviously partners abroad. So, you know, I did make the point again to Ambassador Lighthizer that, you know, whether you're talking about Section 232, whether you're talking about Section 301, um, you know, the implication right now in some of these things, you know, some of these things are expiring in August. Some companies here in, in, India, in, in this country, you know, just received their exemption status or their waiver status in, you know, in uh, March. And we've got things expiring at the end of the year. We have PPE that needs to, you know, be extended out. So I asked him all those questions yesterday, but, you know, he, he's aware. And, and, um, and my point to him was, you know, we're trying to recover our entire economy state by state and then obviously partnerships nation by nation. The last thing that we need right now is you're trying to come out and rebuild and, you know, rejuvenate and, and move back into where we were was these things like taxes and tariffs that, you know, couldn't there be some more breathing room extended here? So he wasn't necessarily the, on the cheering squad of, uh, yeah, let's drop these and extend them. I think his answer to me was no on everything, but I remain very vigilant and I am always waving the flag for uh, let's get past this and let's, you know, get moving with our economy again. We should get well, rid of all these taxes and tariffs. Yeah. yeah. Amen. It would be good for business. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and I, I thought I'd also just extend this too, because uh, you know, both on the issue of, uh, of tariffs and, uh, and also on, on COVID-19, uh, one thing uh, it's at the center of all this, of course, is China. You know, China certainly is where the, uh, where the virus uh, originated. And of course, uh, uh, many of the tariffs are directed at China. And now we've been just talking about the 232 tariffs and the steel and aluminum in uh, the 301s, but, uh, but specifically it seems that there's a consensus on both sides of the Atlantic uh, that this situation with China on, on trade uh, must be addressed in terms of theft of intellectual property, uh, coercive technology, transfer subsidy, you know, uh, improper subsidies of uh, metal industries, for example. Uh, so there's a consensus there. And you know, how do we, uh, is it possible at this stage or if there's a new administration or the, the Trump administration, is it possible to get us all together, uh, Americans, Europeans, um, our friends in Asia, uh, to confront China at the WTO on those various uh, trade abuses that we all agree are? Is each country going to try to cut their own deal with China uh, and make uh, collective action improbable or, or exceedingly difficult? Maybe Dr. Long, do you want to start on that one? And thank you, Charlie. Definitely. I see there's a room for a coalition of the willing and uh, we should all join together, not only the United States, but also Canada but, and Europe and Japan and Australia. And maybe we could also win India. And uh, don't forget about um, those corporations in, in, in Asia itself. They're all not very happy, and, but they're looking for leadership. And as long as there's no leadership, uh, there's no coalition. And, um, and therefore, um, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that we all share the same aim, uh, maybe not the same means or instruments to, to get to that uh, aim, but um, there's uh, still enough time and there's also room for, uh, for a really grand coalition. Okay, Jack, do you think we can put together a coalition or is it the that not going to happen? I, I think it's possible. And I think, you know, one of the questions I get from a lot of companies in this country and also here in Indiana is, you know, especially in the very short foreseeable future, is China going to stay plugged into this trade relationship? And, you know, I've asked uh, Ambassador Lighthizer that many times, and I am confident that they will. Because, you know, really, when you look at trade being the umbrella um, over every country, and then all these things that happen underneath, but at the end of the day, where the conversations are, the partnerships on, on behalf of any country entering into any kind of trade partnership, they need it and we need it. 
And Ambassador Lighthizer again said yesterday, he absolutely believes they're gonna be a continuing working partner. And with that, I believe because that is stable, that we can look in, a, in perimeter areas now and look to the future, look to other countries and say, yeah, we really can. We really can do something on behalf of trade globally. And I don't think it's impossible. I think it's very doable. Okay, well, that's, uh, well, that's encouraging because the days I'm not so sure. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. I thought I'd uh, just kind of pivot back quickly if I can um, in the last few minutes here. I'd like to pivot back, um, you, you know, to the, uh, to, to the pandemic and uh, talking about the future. You know, are, are there going to be any opportunities that you might see uh, for, you know, also let's talk about climate change and green technology. Uh, and investment in, connect, uh, in connectivity, uh, mobility, 5G. You know, how does the pandemic, uh, Dr. Long, how does that, how does that play to these issues uh, going forward? Um, my personal opinion is that it works as a booster um, <clears throat> because it, there will be limitations of money. There will be less investment capacity. So you have to focus. And this is where people rethink and say, so what's really important? Um, and on the European level, mm -hmm. we have these three strategies. It's industry strategy, it's European Green Deal, and digital strategy. And we have to combine it. And since there will be less public spending and there will be less um, private investments, these investments need to be focused on what's really important. So instead of having 50 initiatives, there will be only 15 or 20 and uh, so we will only do what's really effective and we will not do this, the stupid issues. Um, and so I think it's, it's also a chance to have that pandemic because you have to decide what you have to do with your money that is being left, which will be less than last year that was expected. Um, so you need to really um, do your homework and decide where to invest. Sure. Uh uh, Jack, I don't know if you want to take that one on or not. Yeah, well, so, you know, I have a rural area, predominantly rural that I represent. I live in a rural area. And, you know, we've always had the argument, as you know, Charlie, trying to come up with, you know, internet for the country, how to get into rural areas and all of the stuff that we've been through. And we still don't. I still don't have good internet. One of the things that coronavirus has, has really put on the front burner here, if you're not able to communicate digitally and do virtual kind of meetings and things like that, which are going to be with us forever, you cannot be in the conversation. And I think that when um, across bipartisan, bicameral, if there's anything that I think members of Congress have seen that, that are demanding the investment of money and when we talk about infrastructure is broadband. And I think we needed something like this to bring it home to every single member to basically say, you know what, if we're all gonna be the table shareholders of, of rebuilding our future, we have to have mediums like this and we've gotta be able to provide it. Final question before we depart. Um, this has to do with immigration and, and visas in particular. And I know there is an issue where we have obviously a lot of German companies that are operating in the United States in the automotive sector and elsewhere in many, many areas of industry. Uh, but there is a need for skilled labor and I'm under the impression that it is increasingly difficult to get some folks into the United States from Germany who have, you know, who are skilled and are, are going to train American workers in, you know, critical jobs in, in the automotive sector and, and in other areas of uh, 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 technology and industry. Uh, and this is uh, becoming a problem. And uh, Dr. Long, could you address what you're hearing from your side of the pond on, um, on the visa issue? Yeah, you, you described it uh, correctly and it's, uh, it's, it's causing a lot of trouble for companies to, to send people to the US. And um, it's an issue that is so not only valid for Germany, but also for other European countries. And uh, it's, it's in the US interest uh, to, to do this. And uh, so it should be resolved soon. Understood. And I, I don't know, if, Jackie, I don't know if you're hearing anything on the same issue, uh, but getting certain people to and from, they're probably Americans who need to get overseas as well, uh, you know, to, uh, yeah. to engage in, uh, in training and other types of work. Right. That's definitely been a result of COVID is the shutting down, um, not being able to travel. I'm not only seeing it in companies of workers coming over, but at the university level right now, I've got virtually every university in the state of Indiana calling all of us because of what to do with their international students. And this, I mean, COVID has brought everything to a shutdown. And, and I think that's the reason why 
it, there's so much pressure on every state to reopen. We need the rest of the country to reopen so we can have one big whole solution to bringing people over and getting this open. With half the country closed, you know, not every member of Congress is hearing the pressure. You know, they're not up and running like we are. But I would tell you at the university level and for sure at the corporate level, we've got to get moving. Well, well, good. Well, I think we are just about out of time, but uh, I'll just follow up by thanking you both and saying to Congressman Walarski, I'm glad you mentioned uh, education, higher education in particular. They need those students in Maine and rely on that tuition revenue. And you come from a state where uh, Governor Mitch Daniel, or former Governor Mitch Daniels, uh, is president of Purdue University, and he seems to be out in the forefront on you know, uh, on these issues of higher education and how to restart and what things. That, he's a real innovator. We're lucky to have him in your state. You bet. Grateful for Mitch. Yeah. Well, with that, well, again, I'd like to thank both Dr. Long and Congressman Larsky for joining us on this uh, very informative session. Thank you all to the participants, uh, you know, who are listening in today uh, and raising issues. Thank you so much. And uh, please, uh, let's keep at it. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to get together on, under happier times and, and, and in person. So with that, thank you. And uh, thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Charlie.